Hi, my name's Sean. I thank you very much for the introduction. And this is my colleague, Paul Lemire, who's actually doing most of the hard work on Qt 3D and has been for most of this year, first as an intern at KDAB and now actually as a proper full-time KDAB employee. So the aim of this talk is to ideally give you some clues as to what's actually going on behind the scenes with the new Qt 3D architecture. But before we do that, we need to have a little bit of a think. So as James gave in the last talk, we came from Qt 3D1, which was no longer being maintained. So we had an opportunity to think about really what is it that Qt 3D should be doing. So let's have some calls out from the audience first. Who's got some ideas of what Qt 3D should actually do ideally? Cross-platform 3D rendering, okay, so graphics, yep, in the traditional cute sense. What else? Anything else? Mesh loading. Mesh loading, okay, yep. So we'll go through a small list. So we've got 3D, 2D graphics, meshes, materials, we want to change the way things actually appear, shaders. Everyone's heard about these mystical OpenGL shaders. Okay, a few of us unfortunates actually know how to write them, um, or even more unfortunate, know how to debug them. They're a pain. A lot of people want to do things like shadows. Hmm, getting a bit more unusual, okay. And then we get even more obscure, ambient occlusion, be this baked ambient occlusion or screen space ambient occlusion in real time, just like your favorite games do nowadays. High dynamic range rendering. Okay, you may want to simulate the way a real camera lens works. So you have an aperture simulation that shows either very bright areas or very dark areas of a scene. Deferred rendering. Again, many modern games and engines use deferred rendering techniques which is basically put a nice way of decoupling the complexity of the rendering from what you're actually trying to render and more tying it to the resolution of the screen you're rendering. So this is a way of dealing with thousands of lights in a particular scene, for example. And then the all elusive, that cool technique I read about at SciGraph. Oh dear. But what does that mean for us? It means we need to be flexible and extensible. Okay? Now, lots and lots of techniques are in popular use throughout the world. Lots of these are very domain specific and application specific. So, we are not really in a position as library developers to decide for you what techniques you should have available. That's not to say we won't provide some sensible defaults, but we do not want to limit you to only what we provide out of the box and have you come bug us saying, oh, can you please come and implement my favorite technique for this very specialized use case that I'm only ever going to be the only person in the world using ever. We don't want that. I don't have enough hours in the day as it is. So we need a flexible renderer. And eventually, this notion of a flexible renderer came to be manifested in the shape of something that we call the frame graph. But what it boils down to is the way we can specify in terms of data, either through QML or C++, how our scene actually gets rendered. Um, for those of you that don't know, as a comparison, the QQuick2 renderer is a hardwired renderer, and it does its rendering in a couple of passes. First of all, it takes all of the objects in your scene, which are fully opaque, and it renders them in as few batches as it can to get the best possible performance. It then goes back to your scene and looks for all of the items which are not completely opaque. It then takes all of those and it sorts them strictly from back to front, and it renders them with alpha blending enabled. So you get all these nice transparency effects we're all very familiar with in the land of Qt Quick 2. That's perfectly fine for Qt Quick 2 because that's what it is designed to do. It's for designed for doing 2D or 2.5D user interfaces. For generic 3D, unfortunately, that's not generic enough for us. So that would be fine 
and that would be called a simple forward renderer where we do the opaque objects followed by the transparent objects. But as we said earlier, some people want to do things like deferred rendering or shadow mapping or stencil shadows, ambient occlusion, all these other fancy things which require entirely different renderer setups. And we don't want to force people to drop into low-level C++ code to be able to do that. So we've eventually exposed this as a way of defining the renderer configuration entirely from QML or C++ by means of data. But then we thought a bit more. And then we thought, hang on, as soon as people have graphics, they want to do all sorts of fancy things in there. They want to do skeletal animation. They want to have audio. They want to have different input mechanisms. Uh, a whole raft of things, physics, particles, pathfinding, artificial intelligence, fluid simulations, you name it, people want it. Not all of you want everything, of course, but different people want different things and there's no way that we as library developers can come up with the perfect API that provides all of this stuff out of the box, ready to use and is perfect for everybody. That's an impossible task. Oh, and if it's not, pos not too much trouble either, we want to make it nicely scalable across however many CPU cores I happen to have, and we want to make it easy to extend and integrate with existing technologies. So they're just little side requirements, you know, nothing major. So that's where we came from with Qt 3D2. Now, how on earth do we come up with something that can satisfy all of those requirements? Well, we need something that's very, very generic. But to give us an idea of some of the problems inherent in traditional systems, let's have a look at familiar examples like Space Invaders. Okay? This is just an example we picked out of the air because it's easy to understand and everybody's familiar with it. It doesn't have to be a game. But let's think about the object model you might have for such a game. So at the root of the hierarchy, we have an object type. Could be Q object, could be your own object type. And from that, we inherit something called a renderable object. Okay, this is something that gets drawn to the screen, fairly obvious. And then from that, we have both stationary and movable objects. From the station, we have things like the ground and the blockades. And from movable, we have the player object, obviously, which moves left and right across the screen. And then we have the non-player characters, which are in turn space invaders, which yeah, <laughs> drop down a level, reverse direction type thing. And then also the flying saucer boss, which flies across the top of the screen. So this would be a fairly typical, traditional hierarchy. But then the problems start. What if we want to add the capability for something to add sound or emit sound? Well, first of all, we identify all the things that we want to emit sound, which are the ones in gray boxes. And then we think, what can we do about this? Well, first option is we can bubble the functionality up into a base class, and we may end up with something in the common ancestor, something like renderable sound emitter. Uh, that's not particularly neat, but okay. It's just doing rendering and sound, that's fine. But then we want to add in other stuff. And we end up with ridiculous classes like renderable sound emitter, physics animated, collidable AI Uber object. But then we have a big problem because that now means all of our specialized objects are basically inheriting behavior for everything else. And that's just leading to bloat that we don't need and your customized classes are only using bits and pieces of that functionality. So that's not great. We could use multiple inheritance. So for example, we could have our player object and it could inherit from our renderable object and a sound emitter, which both themselves inherit from object. But then we end up with our dreaded diamond of death type pattern, familiar to anyone who's ever dabbled in multiple inheritance. So again, not great. Or we could go for a more restricted form of multiple inheritance and we could say, okay, right, let's pull out that sound functionality into a mix-in class, and we'll have multiple inheritance where we have our class that inherits from our main object tree, but then also multiple inherits from this additional sound emitter class, which provides purely sound functionality. 
That's OK, again, in the simple case. But then when we want to add in sound emitters, physics, input, pick up items, make things collidable, again, we end up with a huge mass of uh, confusion in our inheritance tree. So just to sum up, inheritance has problems which can be summarized as deep and wide hierarchies are very difficult to maintain. If you think about it, if you have a class at the bottom of a class hierarchy, you need to understand that class and all the other classes from which it inherits before you can make changes to virtual functions, which virtuals get called, and extending functionality. Bigger problem, the first one's over achievable with uh, enough persistence, but the bigger problem is class hierarchies are only able to distinguish on one axis for each level in the hierarchy. Okay, we can only distinguish based on one type of thing at each level in the hierarchy. And it's set in stone. Okay, this is a static choice. If we have inheritance, shared characteristics tend to bubble up, as we saw, leading to lots of bloat. Multiple inheritance is just ugly, as we know. Mixing classes, a better step in the right direction, but still it's static. So if that's no good, what else can we turn to? How about aggregation or composition? Beep. So we use has a rather than is a type relationships. It's dynamic at runtime. We don't need to preempt every single possible combination that you guys want to do. And it's very extensible because you can just add in new types that can be aggregated. And now our objects in our simulation are just basically bags of components. And that's it. So we have an example. So we have a Q entity and this is our bag of components. A Q component is also a subclass of Q object. And from that, we derive concrete components, which are things like meshes, materials, transforms, sound emitters, um, collidable volumes, all that kind of thing. We then have, in addition, aspects. Now, these are the systems which sit on the back end of our infrastructure, and they operate on the data contained in the components, which themselves are aggregated by entities. So if we want to add extra functionality to an object, we just attach or aggregate some additional components. And here we can see an example where the mesh, the material on the transform are being picked up by the renderer aspect. The audio aspect, sorry, should actually overlap the transform as well because that also cares about transforms. The physics aspect cares about rigid bodies and collision volumes and things, and a pathfinder um, in terms of AI would also care about a pathfinder component. So that's what the inheritance tree now looks like. We have Q object. From that, we inherit Q node. And all Q node adds in addition is a unique ID, so we can reference things at any time from anywhere. And also the ability to communicate with our backend aspect classes. Q entity, as we said, um, is basically just our bag of components, and Q component is just a building block from which you derive from to make your own specialized chunks of data which your aspects will care about. So our object tree of instances in an Apple actual application would now look something a bit more like this. So we'd have a root node, and then from that we may have a 3D scene, and underneath that branch we would have things like um, a table entity, we may have some chair entities, some audience entities, whatever you care to name. And then in another piece of our object tree we may have our 2D UI represented as cute quick elements, and we may even have some logical entities, for example, things like the new QML state machine wrappers. Fine, so we can all go home. We're done, yeah? <laughs> no. There's a lot more to it than that. 
we do need a few more building blocks to this puzzle before we can all go home and put our feet up. And my colleague Paul will now talk about some of these for you. Thank you, Sean. And please feel free to, to add anything that I may be missing when explaining the wall architecture. So we've divided this diagram into two parts. The first part is the main thread where we have our front end scene tree composed of entities and components. And on the back end, we have our aspect thread with several aspects, each looking for entities in that front end tree that we have. Now, we need a way to communicate between the front end and the back end. And we do that through the cube change arbiter which is an arbiter for notifications that will uh, decide which notifications have to be transmitted to which aspect or to the front end. What we also have is a queue scheduler, and basically what that does is that every frame, it will call each aspect and ask them for a set of jobs to be performed for that frame. Those jobs will be transmitted to the QJob manager interface and will be executed by worker threads in different threads. One little trick there is that we need a queue postman object because we want our notifications sent from the back end to the front end to be triggered in the in the main thread tree. So the queue postman actually gathers up a list of notifications, and when uh, it's, it gets back into the main thread, it delivers all those notifications directly to the main object tree. We'll now move on with some, uh, with some quick examples and slides of all, all, those, all the things that, that I just said. Uh, One quick in. note is the uh, worker threads there. In the existing implementation, they're actually managed by the Threadweaver library, which comes from the KDE frameworks. There are hooks in place such that that could be replaced if, for any reason, the Threadweaver licensing doesn't suit your needs. So you could replace it with, for example, the Intel thread building blocks. Or you could write your own custom backend, which does very simple thread scheduling for jobs based on Qt concurrent, perhaps. Okay. Thank you. So now we'll look quickly at how jobs are, are gathered every frame. As, a, as I just said, the queue scheduler is going to ask every aspect for a set of jobs to be performed. Each aspect is going to give back that list of jobs, and the queue scheduler is going to submit those jobs with their dependencies to the queue job manager interface which will then distribute all of that to the worker trades. Once a job is uh, terminated, we retrieve the, the changes and post notifications to the queue change arbiter. And the queue change ar arbiter then decides to which uh, aspect or if it needs to the front end, it has to deliver those notifications. As a quick example, Let's say that we have a, a, a queue component or a queue node subclass on the front end that has a property change. It signals that to the queue change arbiter. The queue change arbiter will notify all the, uh, the clone entities that are in the back end trees about th that change. And uh, so that the backend tree can be updated accordingly, so that we have a copy in the back end of the front end at every uh, every fra frame uh, sync. Yeah. So the the reason for doing this is to allow us to multi-thread on a large scale. So if you think about normally in QML, we have our object tree in the main thread. If we want to have each of our aspects which may be the renderer or the audio integration or the physics integration or whatever else you guys come up with, operating in a multi-threaded manner, we have two choices. We can either sprinkle locking everywhere, 
which is going to kill performance, or we can take a local copy of the bits of data we are interested in. So if we consider the renderer aspect, i.e. this is inter interested in getting things onto the screen, the renderer will take copies in its own local data structure of things like transformations, the mesh data, what materials you're using, which shader programs you want to use, etc. Whereas, for example, the physics aspect would only take note of collision volumes and things like the mass of objects. So they don't necessarily ha contain the same data or a complete copy of the front-end data, only the vertical slices of the bits they are interested in. And this allows us now, in the worker threads, every frame to operate without locking at all. No, we have the, the same kind of notifications, but that time from the, the back-end aspects to the front-end. And so, as you can see there, we've got one of the back-end components or entity that emits a property change that is sent to the queue change arbiter. The queue change arbiter then sends that notification to the queue postman, which is in the main thread. And in turn, the queue postman delivers that notification in that same thread to the main tree in uh, our QML or C++ scene. Another example that we can use for notifications is when you want to build, build a, a subtree of the scene in the back end or in a worker thread. And you can also use notifications for that kind of thing. First, we'll see when the backend adds a new, a new subtree. Let's say that you have a QML loader that loads a part of your scene of, or of your configuration. The scene tree is loaded. We send a notification to the queue scene, which relays that to the queue change arbiter. The queue change arbiter notifies all the observers of the backend classes about that, that new subtree being added. And so we can uh, update or copy in every aspect of, uh, of our backend trees accordingly. Now that may sound expensive, but we've gone to quite a few lengths to actually make sure this operates relatively efficiently to the point of we've actually got custom allocators for making these small objects um, from a pre-allocated pool of memory and also the change arbiter uses um, thread local storage for each of the queues of the different worker threads when it gets change notifications coming in. So there's very little locking and we're taking quite great pains to make sure this actually works efficiently. So don't worry too much about performance there. Another case that we have is that when we want to load uh, meshes from uh, a, a, a source file, we use asymp, but we could add other scene parsers. And asymp loads the scene through a, a worker thread in the back end so as not to lock the, the main thread and uh, preserve the animations and everything. That subtree is, is created in a worker thread. We send a notification to the queue change arbiter, which in turn relays that to the queue postman so that the front end can update itself and send changes to every aspect so that they also can update themselves uh, in turn. So that's basically the, the whole uh, architecture and how we send uh, notifications to the, the whole aspects thing. Yeah. So the idea is if you want to add in your own piece of functionality, then what you need to do is somehow decompose it down into components. Okay, so these are just blocks of data. These components are what get aggregated inside of the entities in your main thread object tree. And then you provide an aspect by inheriting from Q abstract aspect. And then every frame, you essentially issue a series of jobs that do the work your aspect needs to do based upon its own local copy of the pieces of data it cares about. So we've tried to make it easy to actually make your own custom aspects 
and we're trying to now eat our own dog food by implementing things like the physics back end and the audio back end as proof of concepts. So we'll continue to try and refine this and make this better and better. But in theory, it should be very simple for you to add in your own functionality for things like water simulation or um, heat transfer through walls or whatever it is your particular business does. In addition to that, we can now go and have a look at some of the stuff this makes possible in the renderer. Oh, we may need to increase the font size. Control shift plus normally. That plus. Okay. Which one should we fire up first? Let's do the uh, multi viewport one. Right, so here you can see the good old traditional monkey head, a cube, and a torus all in this pretty naff, browny, plasticine type color. Okay, Morph would be proud. What do we have? We actually have a very simple scene consisting of these three entities, and we'll see how we define those in a second. But what we're actually doing is we're using the power of our frame graph abstraction to configure the renderer to render the same scene four times to these four different corners of the screen. And that's actually on a timer, so every, what, 10 or 20 seconds or so, that should flip around, like then, as to which camera is rendering in which viewport. Okay, so that's something we wouldn't ever think to provide out of the box, that some guy somewhere maybe possibly wants something that renders to four viewports that flips around every 20 seconds. So what we need to do is make that possible for you to do easily. So let's have a quick look at the code for that, if we could. We'll look at the main file first. Right, so the idea here is we import um, Qt Quick 2. Oh, what have I pressed? Oh, sorry, I pressed the button which starts something. Sorry, my bad, I won't press that. We have some import statements. So we import QQuick2, which we're going to be using for the timer. And we import Q3D2 and Q3D.render. So the idea here is each of your custom aspects will be imported in its own QML uh, plugin. So if we had a physics plugin, it might be called import Q3D.physics2.0 or something like that. And then, within of our QML file, we would then be able to use the component types that our plugin or library actually defines. So entity is one of the core Q3D types. And we're then making a camera lens. Don't worry too much about the details of that. That's just to set up our field of view and things like that. And then we have another entity which represents the root of our actual scene. And then inside here, we've got a sequential animation, which is just the standard uh, QQuick2 type, and a timer. Don't need to worry too much about that. It's just flipping between some cameras every time that timer fires. So we're just looping around in a continuous fashion. The interesting part is the frame graph. But before we look at that, can we just scroll down and have a look at the actual scene that we're loading in terms of entities, please? Right, so here our scene is very, very simple. It consists of an entity which itself is aggregating a transform consisting of a rotation animation and then we're using this guy here called a scene loader. So this is what allows us to specify an external scene file and behind the scenes, this does the work of opening that file, parsing it using Asimp or one of the other plugins that we will add in the future and it creates an object tree on the back end. That all then goes through that mechanism that Paul described a minute ago and eventually winds up on the front end. And we have a new piece in our scene, which in this case consists of the monkey head, the torus, and the cube. Right, what else do we have in here? 
That's about it, really, isn't it? And then, okay, let's have a look at the viewport, please. Sorry, not the viewport, the frame graph. You know what I meant. So the frame graph is where we configure our renderer. So instead of having QQuick 2 be hardwired to do opaque followed by transparent, we define that mechanism here. Now, don't worry, you won't have to do this out of the box to make it work. We will provide some sensible defaults for the common cases. But the idea is you can specify and tweak this yourself to suit your own needs. So the frame graph consists of a tree of nodes. Now, those nodes define what the render actually does. Can we just switch back to the slides, please? I think we've got a picture of it in there, haven't we? Right, here we go. So here's a slightly different example, but same principle. So a frame graph may look something like this. We have a bunch of nodes which help us select and refine what the renderer is going to be working on and how it renders things. So at the top there, we have a viewport node, which is going to specify we render across the entire window. It's in normalized coordinates. And we can nest those so that we can render on sub-areas or in normalized coordinates as we see fit. We then have something called a technique filter, which allows us to pick various techniques out of our effect files, as we'll see shortly, and make it work in a particular manner. So we could use a forward rendering technique or deferred rendering, or we could have a fallback solution for low-powered ES2 hardware and do whatever we like. And we have some other classes in the same sort of vein. So a render target would, for example, choose what we are rendering to. Is it a texture? Is it the window? Camera selector does what it says on the tin. It chooses which camera to render from. So you can see in that example we showed on the screen a minute ago, it's obviously going to involve things like the viewport and the camera selector and iterating through which camera we're choosing at each time. This particular example here is what something might look like if you're rendering to a texture and then using that texture in the scene itself. So the stereotypical example here is rendering what a CCTV camera can see in a virtual world and then using that texture on top of a TV monitor or a big projection screen. And there's other things in there like the sort method. Um, you get the idea. Now, the way this actually works is each frame on the back end of the renderer spawns one of these jobs that Paul talked about. Actually, it spawns a whole bunch of them. And we traverse this frame graph. So we traverse it as you would a tree normally, and it collects together all the state at every one of these leaf nodes. So here, we're highlighting these gray boxes so this would be the second part of our configuration for this renderer. And we collect together the state that goes from the leaf node all the way back up to the root node. And we put those together in an object, which we call the render view. And this acts as our um, seed for building the list of things that we send onto the GPU. So here we can see we have three leaf nodes, one, two, three which means we would have three of these render view objects created on the back end. So already we can make nice use of three f threads when we start to process and build the render commands for each of these objects. And that's exactly what the jobs do on the back end. And of course, if you have a much more complex scene graph, you can make use of even more threads. Potentially, each one of these leaf nodes is going to result in a complete traversal of the entities in your actual scene, because it may need to do things like culling, sorting, uh, filtering, based on layers and things like that. So there's lots and lots of work to be done, and this is why we make use of many, many threads. Oops. Ah, too far. And there we go, that's what I was just saying. So we create as many render views as we have leaf nodes, and then for each render view, we spawn a job, which goes off, creates a series of render commands, and those render commands then get inserted 
onto the OpenGL submission thread, which takes care of drawing them in the correct sequence. So it's very similar to what Apple's Metal is doing behind the scenes as well. Right, so we can go back to the example, please, and just have a look at the actual frame graph we've got here. So our frame graph here consists of a viewport at the top level, which renders across the whole screen. We then have a clear buffer node, which tells it what actual buffers need to be cleared each frame. And uh, we also have options to specify what color to clear them to elsewhere. We then have a series of viewports, which correspond to the four quadrants of the screen, and we have a camera selector child for each of those, which tells it which camera to render the scene from. So here you can see it's going to specify four leaf nodes in our frame graph, resulting in four render views, which each get built on a different thread and then submitted in the correct order. And it all just works. But by tweaking this frame graph, you can completely change the way the renderer works. So if you wanted to implement the QQuick2 renderer, you could do it relatively simply by providing a pretty simple scene graph, uh, frame graph, sorry. Okay. Uh, what should we show now? Okay, should we go back to the slides, quickly finish that bit, and then we can show a couple more examples. Right. So what's next? Well, obviously we've still got lots of API polishing to do. It all works. And we can show some more examples in a moment to prove it works with different cases. Um, we had an API review two weeks ago, and we've now got a big long last of tasks, uh, list of tasks in Jira um, to actually make the API a lot more polished. And we're really reducing down what gets exposed to the public. So all those classes you saw in the detailed behind the scenes slide, they're all private. You don't need to worry about those at all but it just helps to understand what the architecture is actually doing. Testing. We're testing as much as we can. Obviously, we don't have access to every possible platform out there and all the different things you guys want to do. So we will hopefully be releasing a tech preview before Christmas. And then you guys can actually pick this up and start to play with it. Um, we know we've got problems with the rendering on Windows at the moment. So if anyone here is a threaded GL Windows expert, I want to be your new friend. Examples, we've got quite a few examples already, lots more to be added on our wish list. Uh, so that's a nice way to come in and contribute and learn the APIs if you want to help out there. And then documentation, mysterious other stuff, and then obviously profit at the end. So does it work? Well, yes, we'll show that in a second. Uh, we're seeing some more examples but there's lots and lots of stuff we haven't talked about today, which James and Pepe touched on briefly in the previous talk. So things like materials, um, effects, techniques, which we will have a brief look at in a second in the examples. So as a nice example, should we show the terrain yeah. demo? So this one, is just to show that we are actually going further than what the old Qt 3 d one did. We can now actually also support the modern OpenGL features such as geometry and tessellation shaders. So this is a single entity which consists of a regular flat grid mesh input and a height map texture. And we're just using that height map texture and we are tessellating the flat regular grid on the fly, depending upon how close or far away the camera is from the actual uh, scenery. And then we're texturing it in the fragment shader based upon things like it's grass if it's relatively flat, it's rocky if it's quite steep, and if it's really, really tall, it gets some snow caps on the top as well. So we can do that. This is all done entirely in QML, apart from one little bit which is generating the mesh data. So if we can have a look at the source code, please. Right. So here we have our root entity after the usual imports. We have our frame graph, which is a very, very simple one. All it does is basically just render everything once. We won't bother digging into that. It's not interesting. 
we have this basic camera, which is just a very simple QML file that wraps around an existing camera class to export properties which are more useful for us here. This configuration guy, ignore that, that's a complete hack until we get input mechanisms sorted out. Just ignore it. It just tells us which um, entity we are actually modifying by the keyboard and the mouse. And then we have this tessellated height map guy. So if we have a look into that, please. Then inside here, we see this itself as an entity which contains a tessellated quad mesh and a tessellated terrain material. And we are aggregating the mesh and the material in the components property at the top there, just below those alias properties. So we can control all sorts of things like the resolution of the mesh that's put in, which particular height map texture we're using. So if you want to change your terrain, just give it a different texture and away we go. The tessellated quad mesh is what generates us our flat regular grid of input data. And we'll have a look at that in a second. If we have a look at the material, please, Paul. So in here, we have a whole bunch of things we can configure. This is just stuff we made up, so you can change what the texture is used for the grass and the rocks and the snow, change the horizontal scale and the vertical scale for how much it's stretched and how much it's tessellated and all sorts of things. In essence, these parameters at the bottom here are what eventually get mapped through to the uniform values in your OpenGL shaders, if you understand what shaders are and how they work. And the effect property there is what specifies where those shaders come from. So if we have a look at the effect, then inside here, our effect is a collection of techniques. And it's these techniques that allow us to have different approaches on different systems. So here we're using OpenGL 4.1 as our minimum because that's what requires, is required for tessellation shaders. Um, if we were doing this on ES2, then we'd have to have some simple fallback which didn't rely upon tessellation, but rather used a fix, fixed grid resolution. We then have a criteria guy right at the top there which tells the frame graph what rendering style it applies to. So if we wanted to do it using a deferred renderer, we would have to supply a technique that says, I will work with the deferred renderer. But again, these are just strings, so you can decide whatever you want to call your techniques and rendering styles. And then within a technique, this consists of a list of render passes. And a render pass is basically one shunt through the GPU of your data. So this, these parameter mappers here are basically just a nice way of converting from the variable names used in your OpenGL shader files through to more friendly names for QML. They're completely optional. If you don't want to use them, you don't have to. You can just use the names directly in your shaders. And then, importantly, last but certainly not least, inside of the render pass, we declare our shader program. And we can specify shaders for every possible shader stage. So if you want to cha change the way this renders, you can just write a new shader, pop it into this property here, and away you go. So if you want to use your own shaders, it's trivial. We're not hardwiring this stuff in. So we won't bother going into the actual details of the shaders, because that would be a day's course in itself. But if we can just have a look at the C++ Please, Paul, that would be useful. So here we've got a very simple main file. Does pretty much what a regular Qt application does. Um, that initialized asset resources line at the top is purely for the examples here, so we can share a single binary resource file. We create a quick window, which is in the Qt 3D quick namespace. And we create a renderer aspect, i.e. we want to be doing rendering. If you wanted to do other stuff like physics, you would create a physics aspect as well to register that there. And then essentially we're just exporting a type for our tessellated quad mesh, as you would any other type from C++. And then we set our QML file, we show it, and we enter the event loop. So all box standard stuff. So if we can just have a look at the tessellated quad mesh, please. Can we have a look at the header file? 
So if you want to provide your own mesh data, at the moment, you can either load it from an external file, or if you want to generate it algorithmically, you can do, go this approach. So we subclass from abstract shape mesh, and then we have to implement something called the mesh functor virtual that you can see there. The rest of it is just property boilerplate. And what we do is we basically provide a functor object which gets passed across to the back end and which can be executed in any one of our worker threads on the back end to generate our mesh data. So if you've got some really complex code that generates some horrendous mesh, you can be safe and sound in the knowledge that will be farmed out nicely onto the back end worker threads and it won't grind your main thread to a halt. Okay, should we quickly show the materials one? We've got five minutes. Right, this example is in no way meant to be a sensible scene. It's just a random collection of stuff with different materials. I knocked this together on Sunday night. So what we can see, we have a rotating trefoil knot, which is just using a simple Fong-type lighting model. We have a flat plane for the floor, which has got a texture applied to it in addition to some nice bump mapping. If you can wiggle the mouse around a bit, you can see the floor looks like those goldy bits are raised. We have a treasure chest in the style of Blizzard, which is just a simple diffuse texture applied to a mesh. We have some plant pots, which the pot parts are also using bump mapping, and that's combined with fong lighting. The plants themselves are going that, taking that a step further, and we're using a technique called um, sample alpha to coverage to get the nice anti-aliasing around the edges of the leaves. Those leaves, when you look at the geometry, are actually just big flat squares. It's the texture that's defining the outline shape and we're using that alpha to coverage to get nice anti-aliasing and order independent transparency as well. And then on the other side, if you can pan it around, there should be some oil drums. And again, these are just using a variety of textures with different bump maps and different materials on them. So we can have a quick look at the QML file for this just to see how we go about this. Let's have a look at main. We'll look at the trefoil knot first, I guess. Oh, sorry, no, let's do the floor. Let's do the plane entity. There we go. So the plane entity is just a simple QML file we made. And inside here, we're just exposing some alias properties, and it aggregates a transform, a mesh, and a material. Woo. Exciting stuff. And the mesh itself is just a mesh that's loaded in from an OBJ file, so nothing particular particularly interesting there. Um, where are we now? Okay, the, yeah, trefoil knot is basically the same thing, but just loading in that mesh entity. We don't need to go into there, I don't think. Yeah, nothing interesting in there. It's just much of the same. The chest, um, again, very, very similar. We're loading in a chest from an OBJ file. You may notice we've got these material things all over the place, so the chest is a good place to start with that because it's probably the simplest one. So we're saying we're using this diffuse map material. That basically just means we're taking a texture and we're applying that as the diffuse lighting component to our object. Although we've included this explicitly in this example, this is very likely one of the candidates to be provided as the standard materials along with these other ones in this example. So inside of here, we have some parameters which we're exporting as properties, and that also includes this texture guy, which we've wrapped up with something called mipmapped texture, which is just a wrapper around the built-in texture object and set some default properties on it. Nothing exciting there, unless you're really into OpenGL textures like I am. Okay, can we go back to the last one? Um, into, if we scroll up a little bit, there should be a whole bunch of effects defined up here. Now the reason we're defining the effects here is because right now these are not shared on the back end, but they will be soon. So normally you'd just be able to include these directly in your QML files and not worry about 
repeated usage. So if we have a look at the, I don't know, diffuse map effect, please. So inside here, we've got a technique. It's using OpenGL 3.1. It's got a render pass. And then right down the bottom, we specify what shaders it's using. Much of the same. And then we've basically just got rinse and repeats of that. So if we just go back to the main QML file briefly, Paul, which is a whole bunch of different effects that do more and more complex things, including like the alpha to coverage stuff. And then down the bottom, we include our plane entity, the tree foil knot, the chest, some house plants, which just pick up different textures and meshes, the barrels, and that is the entire QML file. So once we abstract all of those materials and things into the core, this would basically be what a 200 line QML file to get that scene up and running. So that gives me some hope that we're actually on the right track. And of course, if we combine that sort of thing with what we saw earlier with the uh, multi viewport example, you could render that in any way you see fit. Yep. So the scene graph, easily defined in QML, but so is the frame graph, which defines the renderer. So hopefully that's given you a taste of what we've been doing for the last year and what's coming in the near future. So I believe we'll stop there and we've got a few minutes for some questions. Thank you. And I need a drink. Um, I had one question regarding the way you submit uh, data to OpenGL. You talked mm -hmm. about uh, an OpenGL queue or s something that you submit batches to. Yep. I was wondering, because you have so many threads in the back end, do you have multiple contexts sharing uh, data and using multiple contexts to upload data to the GPU memory? Good stuff question. Like that? The answer is no, we don't. We have one OpenGL context. We are just building up the render commands on multiple threads. And then each of those render views that contains the render commands for a particular configuration gets sent onto the OpenGL submission thread and queued up. So essentially, the OpenGL submission thread is just continuously spinning. Well, it blocks until it gets some commands to actually render. So each of those render views gets put in the correct index slot. So no matter which order the threads finish in when they're building them, they still get rendered in the correct order but we only have one OpenGL context. So it's cheap. So are you sure you're actually saturating the It depends entirely what you're doing. We're not necessarily saturating the CPU or the GPU. Um, as an example, that terrain tessellation example uses approximately 1% of my CPU because it's not doing anything. It's tessellating on the GPU side. Yeah. Yes, it's tessellating on the GPU side. Um, but if I also wanted to do um, audio simulation and physics as well at the same time that would obviously use more CPU cores. Yeah. I have this question because drivers is supposed to be optimized now for multi-threaded uh, context and using multiple threads to actually upload stuff or do various operation having different submit queues and things like that so it, do you plan on leveraging, leveraging that? No it varies wildly between drivers. Um, I know drivers have improved with multi-threading and contexts but there is always still an overhead, and that overhead is currently measured typically between 5 and 15% as soon as you share two contexts. So at the end of the day, you're addressing a single GPU. These need to be serialized somewhere. We're just doing the serialization where we have control over it rather than inside the driver. Any more? Haven't put you all to sleep, hopefully. Um, how, <clears throat> how does this uh, scale uh, for, for large scenes or uh, in complex scenes, like uh, hierarchical, all kinds of stuff? Yeah, I mean, in terms of hierarchical, it's basically whatever your CPU is capable of doing. It uses all available CPU cores, which, again, we will probably expose as a tweakable configuration so you can limit it to some subset of cores. Um, but it works perfectly fine. Have you got or, ex experience with that? Uh? An example for that? Not anything with me at the moment. Um, but basically, all the heavy lifting is done by the jobs on the back end. Mm -hmm. So all the front end does is it basically consists of data. So all your front end objects consist of a few properties. 
At the moment, we've shown examples using animations using the Cute Quick 2 animation items. When we get to Cute 3D 2.1, for example, we will probably provide an aspect which does animations on the back end jobs as well. So at the moment, your limitation is likely to be updating those animations on the main thread. Right. But the actual calculation of the world transforms and the hierarchical bounding volumes are all done on the worker threads on the back end. Okay. Thank you. Um, first small question. We saw some tiering in these examples. It's only the beamer. Because for, the, for us, um, it was... Um, the performance, was, performance wasn't great on the screen. Oh, it's probably just Paul's laptop and the V-Sync issues on that. Anytime you render to two screens, you can only V-Sync to one display, and it's probably just V-Syncing to Paul's actual monitor there. Okay, thank you. Yep. The V-Sync and tearing is entirely dependent upon the driver and your compositing window manager. It looked terrible up there, did it? I apologize. Um, is it possible to force a specific execution order of aspects? Um, at the moment, it's hardwired um, based on an enum value, but that was part of the API review that we covered. So we want to make that indeed configurable for the execution order of the aspects of their particular jobs. So it's coming. It's not there right now. But yes, we appreciate the need for that because you may want your skeletal animation system to run before you actually do the rendering. I had another question about your Postman class. And yep. I was wondering why aren't you just uh, firing signals from one thread and handle the, the, the event in another thread? Do you want to avoid creating, uh, actually allocating and posting events? Is it purely for performance issues? It's to avoid um, very fine-grained locking. Because whenever you post an event to another thread, it locks the event queue, obviously, so it can post it. So we're basically trying to minimize that. So we batch up all the changes and send that in one collected. And in actual fact, the change arbiter does similar thing, but in the other direction. So that's got a change queue for each of the worker threads using thread local storage. No more? Okay. One more. Uh, do you see any limitations with many, many, many objects? Um, not necessarily, no. It all depends on the scalability of your CPU and your GPU. Um, at the moment, as I said earlier, the animations are currently done on the main thread because we're using the Qt Quick 2 items. But later on, we'll add things like skeletal animation, which will actually be naturally delegated to the back-end worker threads. So the more cores you have, the better we will scale. No, no, not Passy. He's going to ask me a hard question. Don't worry. Um, I'll be gentle. So uh, how does the uh, OpenGL versioning and profile selection work? So can I actually now set the uh, requirements per shader program or just per... Techniques per technique, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Are you planning to maybe go into more detail on that, like on the uh, like being able to set it on the uh, shader program level? Probably not, because you can just put the shader program one level up in your QML file and then just reference it within the techniques. Right. So that okay. really wouldn't buy us a great deal, I don't think. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, we're trying to keep the GLSL completely standard. So we don't want to impose restrictions on what people can do inside the GLSL with any of these fancy preprocessors and conversions. No further questions? Then please join me in thanking Mr. Sean Harmer. Thank you.